and uh, despite the fact that uh, his practice continues, there is uh, some uh, minor details that I can track to the previous show. I don't know if it's true, but say looking at that painting, like those little two bars were identified as the uh, pointer on the compass. And so again, despite the fact that this show uh, is comprised of non-objective imagery, you can deduce some sort of fragmented narratives from the titles, some of which, or most of which are personal. For instance, uh, the painting, the one choice line, uh, references uh, Sean's childhood, I believe, and the place where he grew up. And so, anyway, so there is all these little narratives that can be deleted. But let us welcome Sean and have him say a few words. Thank you. And again, well, thanks for coming out. Uh, such a beautiful open August uh, afternoon. So I've titled this talk this kind of wellness based off of you know obviously the show and thinking through the last couple of years of uh, work and the, especially the last uh, year and a half of painting this exhibition. I do want to go back in time just a little bit. Uh, and just talk about uh, some of my Ontario experiences and uh, the work that was created there. I hope to uh, talk about conceptual kind of uh, structures, the formal language in the work, studio processes, um, you know, this idea of material gravity and proposed or implied imagery. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge the unceded territory here of the Salix people, um, where we're gathered uh, this afternoon. So outline for today's talk, I want to talk about research context, formative, academic, and personal influences. So I, I suppose I'm going way back in time there, um, but I won't spend much time on it. I just do want to frame up for you folks, especially um, the people in the room who don't know me very well, uh, kind of my earlier uh, influences. Talk about a show at the Rodman Hall Art Center inland, uh, some collaborations and various set of projects that, that provide a context for this kind of wilderness and gives you a kind of survey of what I've been up to for the last uh, seven, eight years uh, since I've, I've left the Okanagan because some of you may or may not know I used to teach for the University of British Columbia um, before I relocated to Ontario. So now I'm back uh, at the University of British Columbia here at the Kelowna campus. So it's exciting. It feels a little bit like a homecoming for me. And so does the show, uh, to be quite honest. It's uh, uh, a great way to start uh, our lives, my life, my creative practice here in the Okanagan again, or restart it, is by having this, uh, uh, this show here with Lou Roche and the community. So formative academic influences. Uh, before I started art school, I was in environmental sciences, interested in, I still am interested in environmental sciences. I have often uh, toyed with the idea of going back to school um, and you know, engaging in, in a more scientific kind of uh, pursuit. Um, imaging through map making processes, uh, chaos theory, anti-aesthetic theory, uh, the whole idea of what makes something attractive or beautiful or valued, I, I'm very much interested in that dialogue and have been and still am. Um, environmental, industrial aesthetics, uh, relational abstraction, sacred geometry, Canadian art history, um, and of course painting, drawing, uh, printmaking, and site-specific environmental interventions. All these things are coalesced to generate kind of the current version of myself in the studio. Formative personal influences, unknown ancestry. I, mean, I don't know my, my uh, uh, paternal side of my ancestry. Uh, prairies, growing up on the prairies. I grew up in Saskatchewan, the Canadian Shield, agricultural landscape. Uh, Churchill River system was a big part of my youth and upbringing. Uh, armor culture, ornamentation, the homestead, farming. I have a military history, so I think that does enter my, my, my studio practice in a, in a subtle way, uh, infantry discipline. Uh, 
fatherhood and play, I have three children, so I know that that influences my, my art practice via time and all the uh, you know, experiences that come along with being a father. I've been in a number of collective art studios, so I have a keen interest in collaboration. I've met a lot of painters and artists just by sharing spaces over the years. So, so this idea of, you know, when people ask me, what do I do? Um, what am I interested in? Of course, I talk about being an artist, a painter, um, and then of course it gets deeper. What, is, what do you paint? Um, I talk about myself being an abstractionist and a landscape uh, painter at certain times, and I kind of jump between those two kind of genres. And, and I do that uh, based off this idea of relational abstraction where uh, Biederman talks about uh, that nature is the genetic, genetic source of all abstractions of art. Um, and I, I believe that to be true, at least in my case, that everything I do in the studio, every mark I make, every um, decision formed in my studio practice is somehow connected to the landscape. My experiences, um, my understanding of it, not just the visuals and you know, our, um, the definition of the scape or the, the, the kind of human relationship and the human gaze relative to the uh, landscape, but all the things that are underneath the earth, the, the, the geology of it, the, uh, the history of it, the time, when you look at a space, how much time is actually there, what, what, what elements, what human remnants are there. I'm, I'm interested uh, in all those aspects of that space or that, that, that landscape or that uh, partial view of a landscape. And of course, the poetics of space, very much interested in poetry and you know, thinking about uh, degradation and restoration and humanity's mark upon the land. So I love how the Aspen Grove is reclaiming this um, old concrete structure I just feel like it's a very poetic image. And I, I often say that this photograph, um, you know, if I could sum up my painting practice in one photograph, it would be this, this, this image here. Because uh, the tension in the work is always between geometric kind of forces or the intelligent human element uh, versus chaos and, and randomness and, you know, or seemingly you know, random marks. Um, so it's this tension that I quite find, uh, I, I find quite fascinating. Oops. Uh, here's a, an image just kind of, you know, Northern Saskatchewan, it's an old canoeing uh, map that I, you know, I had from when I was a kid. So again, spending a lot of time uh, in, you know, the wilderness really, because uh, Northern Saskatchewan is, is, is quite wild in the sense of, um, you know, there's not a lot, relatively speaking, uh, human interventions uh, when you get past uh, you know, Lorange. So, uh, but of course, you know, yeah, the human mark is is, is kind of uh, throughout that that landscape as well. And growing up on the prairies, thinking and how flat it is, of course, always trying to feel um, or trying to rock, trying to rise above and see the landscape and see the geometry of. Um, of that space and, and being quite influenced by, um, you know, how as humans we have manipulated the landscape and turned it into uh, a space or a, a, a kind of habitat that is, is um, quite different than the, than the original kind of uh, pre-human or pre-anthropocene kind of uh, space. So, I am interested in this, this new kind of era that we seem to be living in, in which we call the Anthropocene, and uh, just thinking about how we've affected not only a you know, specific space, but the, the world at large. Uh, here, you know, chaos theory again, um, thinking about just illusion and and you know, kind of visual thresholds. And I know as a youngster, when I was started out as an artist, I was very much you know, interested in that, that threshold of you know, kind of aesthetic ex excitement. Um, what was needed to uh, kind of excite me as a young painter. So uh, still very much influenced by uh, those types of illusions and all kinds of things that relate to 
the kind of, uh, of chaos theory and chaos as it truly exists, you know. And I grew, I grew up uh, in, you know, surrounded by landscape painters, pioneer landscape painters, and shared studios with many of them. So here we have Dupuis, and then we have Otto Rogers on the left. So growing up in Saskatchewan, I was sandwiched between formalist, well, I wouldn't say Otto is here, but there was a lot of formalist abstraction, you know, um, Otto Rogers here being more metaphysical in terms of, and landscape kind of connected to, to that abstraction. But between abstraction and plein air abstraction, or plein air uh, painting, landscape painting, I was sandwiched in between those two spaces. And I grew up looking at both. Uh, so that it was a natural evolution for me to be uh, kind of interested in you know, abstraction as a vehicle for you know, kind of landscape narratives. Uh, a couple other early influences, I worked with Graham Peacock for a couple of years as an assistant leading painter on the left, and very, you know, very highly synthetic, um, uh, you know, material kind of base painting. And then on the right there, influenced by this Mark Boyle, uh, for the Boyle family, and their, you know, uh, journey to the surface of the earth, and other projects as well. Um, so on one hand, I'm very much influenced by highly synthetic painting, but also painters who engage in kind of this illusion of natural uh, representation, because this is in fact a, a resident cast of the Earth's surface. And there's other artists in the world who use natural materials and who represent the landscape in a very realistic, uh, you know, illusionistic way. So. So it's in between those two spaces that I, I kind of exist, or I like to think I exist. So the first project I will talk about here is Inland. It was curated by Stuart Reed at the Rodman Hall Art Center in 2016. It was a four-year project. Uh, the main question under scrutiny for this exhibition was, where am I? Because uh, this is uh, you know, three or four years after I had relocated to the Niagara region of of Ontario. So it was a big move for us as Westerners and growing up in Saskatchewan, living in Alberta and British Columbia, and moving my family out to uh, southern Ontario. So there was, you know, there was a period of, of constantly asking that question. Um, you know, here I was physically surrounded by water, new observational terrain. I'm very much interested in, uh, influenced by uh, everyday experiences, like most of us. Um, I don't know how much that infiltrates um, some of the artists in the room's art, but I know for myself, uh, it does influence my vision that was an industrial uh, parts of it, or at least an industrial powerhouse for many years. So you can see the remnants of that, and you can see the remnants of the Carolinian forest. You can see um, all kinds of things, all kinds of paradoxes between beautiful natural forest and then, you know, this kind of industrial wasteland. And I, I was very much influenced by that, um, that paradox, uh, probably for the whole nine or 10 years that I was there. But here is a image of the Robin Hall Art Center. It was a part of the Brock, Brock University up until uh, about a year ago. So it's an old 1863 uh, mansion built by Thomas Robin Merrick uh, between 1824 and 1906. So there's a, a number of build elements there. It's a beautiful space. So the exhibition was responsive as I've, I've started to talk about here. We have the Welland Canal and the ships and the, the transport of goods. So I, I would see this every day and, and quite fascinating because you know growing up on the prairies you didn't see this every day. And sometimes there would be ships in the landscape. You wouldn't see the canal but you'd see this giant ship in the landscape which was quite fascinating. Uh, I've sometimes uh, thought of that the, some of these conglomerates, I call these, these large forms conglomerates, kind of felt like ships that, that shouldn't be there in, in, in the space or the pictorial field. That's one interpretation for uh, those large uh, relief elements in the paintings. So here we have an image of Lake Ontario on the left and Lake Erie on the right. So I don't know, I think it was maybe the first couple of years living there, I was very much aware of 
the pollution and you know sometimes in Lake Erie with algae blooms with the high uh, fertilization around the lake there's so much farming around the lake you'd get a lot of algae blooms it would kill off a lot of the fish so there was times we would walk on Lake Erie and there'd be a lot of uh, fish that uh, were littering the uh, sea or the, the lake shore and it was a bit unnerving thinking about um, that the prospect of you know, just the, the quality of the lakes, and we know that they're going through a restoration program. But, you know, it made you think as a father, you know, what should I, um, should my kids go swimming? You know, checking the water app and looking at the quality and just thinking about, you know, as, as, a, as, as, as humanity, we are, you know, we've been so uh, harsh with our environment and the poisoning of it, right? And, and still today, um, but certainly when we think of the last uh, six, seven, a hundred years, you know, the, the kind of what we've done, you know, to the landscape. So uh, this is one of the paintings in the exhibition. And uh, so there's an excerpt from Rod, or from uh, the uh, exhibition text uh, by Stuart Reed, and it's, Again, the, you know, the, the show is quite complex. I'll unpack it here for you. Uh, there's large and small format paintings. There was a catalog produced as well. Uh, a little bit later after the show, it was, we, we're calling it a, a monograph. It's a monograph catalog. And it was um, printed and designed uh, in Austria, Salon für Kunstbrucht in, in 2019. Um, and uh, it's quite a lovely little catalog. Uh, has some has a, a large poetic piece by Richard Fawcett um, there, and there's a little excerpt that you can see um, about Hurricane Katrina. So it's a, a catalog that is both talking about this hurricane, and it's also a catalog that is referring, the paintings are referring to this kind of poisoning of, of the Canadian landscape. Uh, so here's a painting here, a small uh, portrait of a mark series that was a part of the show. So this would have been an example of um, one of the small paintings in that exhibition. And uh, the portrait of the mark series um, is really, uh, it's been ongoing for a long, long time. And it's, it's really kind of looking at marks as being intelligent portraits of something, of something human, uh, something living, something intelligent. So a lot of these marks that you see in here, um, some of them are more simplified, some of the relief elements in this show, but their genesis comes from this idea that marks can be intelligent. Abstract marks can carry a lot of you know, conceptual weight. It's not just a mark, it's just not a, a mark that contributes to a bunch of other marks to showcase or to give us a whole experience. They are, but they are something else. And so some of the marks became uh, intelligent portraits of something alien, possibly, something um, terrestrial. There's a couple of examples of uh, some larger format work. So Lubos commenting on this, the bars that you see uh, in the white painting in this show um, have been around for, for a while now. And I've been using them as a, as a, a compass, a bearing, a dock, a, a stabilizing factor. It obviously comments on uh, art history and you know abstraction and the, the idea of ge geometry and the history of geometric abstraction uh, in particular. Inland green, uh, thinking about environmental post-apocalyptic landscapes of refuse and discard and contemporary abstractions of bright and shiny visual landfill of painterly codes and conventions. So, you know, there's a tension in the work that is both, uh, there's a poison in the work, there's a, there's, there's a disturbance in the work, but there's also a beauty and a purity in there as well. And I think you get that in this exhibition as well, is there's a poisoning in these paintings, uh, but there's also a beauty there that is either is residual or it's, it's reclaiming the painting or the space. But it's there. there, there is that tension, so. There's another shot from this exhibition. 
is another one. So, you know, some of the other portrait marks, here's trench. Uh, so thinking about, you know, inside, outside. So here you can see that this is quite a thick uh, painting. Uh, looks like it's three or four inches thick. And then I've come back and I've, I've, I've run it through the table saw and I've uh, cut it numerous times to reveal the sinews and the, the, the uh, organs of the painting and the history, the excavation, the archeology span of the painting. Um, so I'm very much interested in indirect uh, layering and just the, the, the process of, of covering up and negation within an artwork. There's another example, the second white, which is obviously a close cousin to uh, the white painting you see on the wall over there. So I like to work in series, no doubt, and um, to really investigate a body of work and a, an idea or a process, um, an image. I, I, I like to work on it three or four, maybe five times before I have to massage out the, the kind of essence of it before I move on or, or challenge challenge that language with, with some foreign element. Uh, here is a, an image from Niagara Falls. Uh, I'm sure most of us maybe have visited Niagara Falls, of the, the tourist area. Um, but I, I use this image just to address the synthetic or plastic element in my work. Uh, so this is uh, taken from an upside down tourist attraction in Niagara Falls that my, my kids love to go to. But I feel like this, this captures uh, society's dependence and repulsion of our plastic culture, because it's everywhere. It also speaks to play and gravity and the tension I try to capture in my work. So here, I don't know if you see the connection there, or I don't have a, a side profile of this painting, but this painting is high relief, kind of grotesque, but beautiful at the same time, in terms of the complexity and the density of the work. So there was a period, and I think there's always been, you know, kind of a desire for this, but especially in the um, kind of, you know, the 2015, 2016, probably was the beginning of it. I was very much interested by, in, in this idea of, of the ugliness of painting. Can it be ugly? Is there value in that? And honestly, I, I think, it, you know, growing up out West, you're not exposed to a lot of, paint, like abstraction, uh, or at least Eastern abstraction. Um, no, not a lot of it, at least. Uh, but out there, uh, living in Ontario, you know, I spent far more time with William Ronald and Ronald Moore paintings, and a lot of kind of early uh, abstract paintings that I didn't spend a lot of time with uh, growing up out west. And I was quite mesmerized by the ugliness of some of the paintings. It is so, you know, uh, I don't know, just, just so unpleasant to look at. And I found that quite fascinating. So I, you know, here's a painting that is kind of a response to um, a William Ronald work. And you know, I, just, I think the messiness, the awkwardness, the, the unpleasantness of some of Ronald's paintings were really inspiring. And uh, I found that I took it on as a challenge to really um, challenge my own mark making, because I, I think for many years, I, I thrived on a, 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 this visual threshold that really was seeking harmony and some sort of continuity and consonance and beauty. And, and, and you know, the older I get, the more I embrace the, 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 the kind of the ugliness of painting and how it can become uh, uncontained and how can you break some of the rules that you know you've formulated or have embraced over the years or you think in fact are rules like why do you how why do I believe that to be a, a particular rule in painting uh, so here's a, another work you know that came from you know the investigations of, of, of trying to push into new territory with uh, that William painting there was a whole series of those so um, and some of them were complete failures, to be quite honest, that I look at today if I have some of them, I think that's just one ugly painting, you know, it's just, there's nothing good about it. But there was so much value in the, uh, the learning. There's a detail of these works. So, you know, over time, the work became more complex, 
and, and, and more interesting um, based off of uh, that synthetic, anti-aesthetic kind of pursuit. I'm very much interested in negating complex information, so I like to, I'm sure when you've seen, you, as you've looked at the show, you, you realize that there's so many marks, there's, there's translucency and there's, there's residual marks and there's just a lot of erosion happening in the, in the show. And I'm very much interested in the complexity of that erosion. Um, I'll find myself walking down the street and I, I love looking at painted lines on the, on the street. That, you know, especially old streets where they've come and painted the lines, the yellow and white lines, 50 times. I just like looking at the history of that painted mark. Um, and, you know, this whole need in myself to come and, and cover up complex marks has been a part of me now for a very long, long time. And I think this painting here is a great example of complex information. So here are some other dark paintings um, that were a part of that show. I won't get into to these, but um, um, maybe I will get into one of them here. Unnamed. So, you know, this work is named after a personal story of tragedy in, uh, in, in our family, uh, someone who lost their life, and um, it was a workplace accident. And uh, I, I was thinking of just oily tar and, and just the, Again, the, the, the poison of that, and uh, you know, this family member happened to work uh, and lost their life in Alberta tar sands. So, um, you know, this painting is simultaneously stark, raw, and pleasing. Again, a visual conceptual paradox. So, uh, you know, there was about I don't know. There must have been twenty, maybe twenty-five, really dark, mixed black, churning, oily. Uh, paintings that were a part of that, uh, uh, well, uh, that I gleaned uh, for that exhibition. So, a couple large format paintings in that exhibition. There's scale, uh, very similar. This is kind of, you know, this is my typical um, scale that you see in this exhibition here. And the large paintings you see in the slideshow would be this scale as well. I'll move on about some of these smaller works. So seeing, so here you have, uh, the body is now becoming a part of more pronounced uh, element in the work, a possible portrait of intestines, an intestinal gesture versus red-green contrast, optically a very difficult painting to look at, um, all sculpted out of acrylic. So that intestinal cord structure is just acrylic paint. So again, thinking about you know, the aesthetic kind of ramifications of a painting like this. Here's another install. It was a large exhibition. I think it was over 40 works, multiple rooms. Uh, in some ways, it, it, you know, I, I could look at it as a mid-career kind of um, survey of, 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 of my work, even though it only included four years of work. It, was, you know, it included 20, 25 years of thinking and image development and process development. Yellow tea. Cross number two. So you can see these are, are marks that have been cut. So the left and right mark were once uh, joined. They were one mark and I, I split them and, and mirrored them on, on the canvas. And uh, you can see the high relief all sculpted out of acrylic paint. Uh, just draw your co connection to some work here. I think these are 10 years apart. Yeah, 10 years apart. So on the left is the newer piece, and on the right is an old painting from 2004 uh, stone series where I was collecting and embedding stones and minerals into my work um, and creating these kind of abstract equations or intelligent kind of alien uh, structures or landscapes of based, just based off the placement of the stones. So I, I find it really interesting going back in time and looking at my practice and looking at some of the processes that I have in terms of, I have a, I have a, I have a certain collage aesthetic of collaging uh, 
marks that are created off canvas into paintings. And, uh, and I have connections as well, thinking about uh, that to uh, my printmaking history of you know the indirect nature of printmaking and the collage elements of printmaking through you know stenciling and whatnot. So, so here's a, a, an installation in that exhibition of paintings, and of course the gold leaf is there to challenge the aesthetic and uh, you know challenge the history of of, uh, of painting. So there's a number of works, uh, gestural anchor. So I, I do have, I, this is still an interest of mine, um, is breaking the picture plane like this. Um, I think over the next 10 years, that, that's gonna be my focus, is, is to do large format kind of um, breaking of the picture plane, because I very much love the tradition of painting and the rectilinear form, and, and I could paint on canvases and, and rectangles for the rest of my life, but I also like the idea of of growing uh, structures out of them uh, onto the floor and becoming far more sculptural. And hence, you know, that's why you see this small sculpture in, in the room here. That's, it's speaking to this interest that I have. And it's just a matter of making the decision of do I connect uh, the sculptural element to the painting or do I not connect it? Uh, and in the case of this exhibition, um, there's no physical direct connection, but it's implied, you see it, right? You can tell that, you know, if, if I could snap my fingers and have all these forms crawl off the canvas right now, that'd be amazing if I did that for the, the few of you, right? It'd be like, that'd be a special moment for us all if I had those kind of powers. Because um, I like the visual of that. Maybe that's what I need to do over the next 10 years is be able to do that, right? Create little robotic marks, I don't know. But if I could, you know, snap my fingers and they all oozed and plopped on the floor and they crawled to the center, climbed up the plants, and then just kind of, you know, did their thing and got into their form. That, that's kind of the idea is I'd love to be able to have my viewers experience that. Um, and in this room right now, it's just implied, but it would be fascinating to uh, be able to do it, you know, um, as an exhibition at some point. Um, so, uh, here's a, I was asked a few years ago, 2017, this is a Wilfrid Loyer, Loyer uh, University Press, um, Landscapes and Landmarks of Canada, Real, Imagine, Reviewed. Um, I was asked to provide the cover image for uh, a collection of, of essays uh, looking at the Canadian landscape, talking about it, so. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned my children have an influence, uh, and they do, because I'm surrounded by plastic, you know, and I am, I play, my kids want to play all the time, this is my youngest here, not too long ago, and I just love the, the connection between these two images, because here's an old painting from 2011, but you can see it's pretty obvious here, you know, it's, I'm playing with melted versions of, of my daughter's toys. And I am essentially, as an artist, as a painter, uh, the type of painter I am, I'm engaged in play all the time. That's how I learn. So uh, so I, I worked here. This was, our, this was a school, my previous employer and uh, colleagues. I, I, I collaborated uh, with the build of this school and uh, was there for the opening. And, um, you know, the school opened in 2015, Diamond Schmidt Architects. And yeah, it was an amazing experience, amazing people. There's a school there, theater, a big, big theater, uh, music program, uh, studies in arts and culture. Uh, big 2,000 square foot painting studio, drawing studios, amazing space, downtown St. Catharines. And uh, I spent nine, nine years there as part of the faculty there. Uh, so great, great experiences, great learning. Here's some images of the build. Uh, so it was quite fascinating to be a part of this and to be able to walk through the spaces. It's an old hair cloth building. Uh, 19th century, so part of it's a new build and part of it was a restoration and a slash repurposing of an old hair cloth building. There's a shot that's one of my paintings hanging in the school, the Maryland Iowa School of Fine and Performing Arts, Brock University. 
Here I am at an opening at a pseudo fiction with Catherine Prayer. I'm centered with her there in the middle at the Pierre Leon Gallery in Toronto. So I have an eight year collaboration history with um, uh, Dr. Prayer. And we've done all kinds of projects all over the world um, with different universities and, all, and most of the time including students within those projects, be it having just an exhibition of student and faculty work um, at the universities, uh, you know, uh, of the West Indies in Trinidad or in Austria. Um, we've done a lot of different things, a lot of text and image-based works. Uh, this is actually two uh, images of work that we did together, uh, we have done together, and we've made lots of different drawings and paintings together over the last eight years. But this is a, another outlet I have as a, as a, as a creative person. Um, I, I won't go into detail here about this, but um, yeah, it's been a, a, a real great learning experience to collaborate with, with other artists, and I would encourage you folks to, to do more of that. And there is a, a shot of uh, the opening of um, that show. Another project here, Post-Industrial Ephemera, Soundings, Gestures, and Poetics from 2017. It was an exhibition uh, jointly funded between um, uh, the State University of New York at Buffalo and Brock University. A full catalog was produced. So it was a major um, undertaking. 40 plus artists participated. This is an image uh, from the American building. Um, uh, artwork pictured in the foreground is from Art Industria. So it's a neon uh, artwork in the beginning here at the foreground. Um, this is Marine A. So Silo City is a large um, complex uh, in Buffalo, New York, uh, with uh, a lot of working grain elevators, concrete ones, and a lot of uh, concrete uh, elevators that are no longer, they're decommissioned. Uh, this was the first of its kind grain elevator, and it was built in 1925. The silos themselves are 120 feet of solid concrete. Uh, they have incredible acoustics when you walk through them and around them. There's, it's, it's like walking through a post-apocalyptic landscape. Uh, movies have been shot here. All kinds of artists from around the world have gravitated towards the site um, to do creative projects. So we were asked to, um, over a two-year period, uh, to travel there and document the site and just visit it and experience it on different occasions. And um, yeah, and, and work towards a public exhibition, a group exhibition, because there was 40 of us. Uh, so we had to choose spaces and things like that and, uh, and just become inspired by the space, so. And there is another image. So that night, um, Harmonia Chamber Singers performed Medieval Chants in, in one of the silos. And it was the most compelling musical, musical experience um, one of them of my life, it really was, because it was, it was so beautiful and so unnerving at the same time, because you wondered if something would fall apart all around you, or, you know, would you die in this uh, silo? Because, uh, you know, there's bricks, concrete. Uh, the, the insurance to get this, to pull this off, was quite a uh, serious effort on many, many people's part, because uh, the, uh, the place was... Uh, falling apart. Certain silos and spaces were, were quite dangerous to enter. Uh, there were performances, all kinds of wonderful uh, things happening uh, in this, this group exhibition. Uh, um, the structure was built in 1907 and decommissioned in 1963. Uh, you know, I responded through my, my upbringing, uh, of the, you know, growing up in the prairies and thinking about the wood grain elevators and how the wood grain elevators in the prairies uh, shifted to concrete only in, I, I, I was like a teenager, so, you know, early 90s or something, maybe the late 80s they started to shift. But I was instantly drawn to this space, just the white concrete, uh, the first floor of the Pro Annex was spacious, stunning white concrete, and I'd love to work here again. Um, and here was uh, some images from what I used. I, you know, I. I wanted to bring in bright colors, of course. I, I wanted to think about the synthetic nature of seeds. Uh, since I am a, an acrylic painter by and large, I, 
I thought about you know just seed storage, seed production, and these the commodity ex commodity exchange in these grain grain elevators and where they went you know across the world. So I, I my 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 core focus here were seeds and these synthetic forms, which was really the beginning of well part of the beginning of creating these uh, forms that you see on these paintings, um, and you can see them there. So I have some traditional, conventional paintings. I, I titled this piece Alloy. Uh, so just thinking about bringing different uh, content, different concepts, different materials together uh, to form uh, some new substance, a, a new alloy. Uh, so synthetic seed forms uh, were being stored here, maybe possibly produced here and are now growing into larger, unknown, abstracted forms. So I, I like this idea of, of paintings growing and changing and shifting. And I, I believe that was a, that's a part of my thinking in this exhibition because of all the churning and the activity. Because even when I look around the room, you know, there's, you know, the three paintings on that wall, they're, they're, they're churning. There's, there's nothing static about them. They're active. They are wrestling with each other. They're... They're alive, right? Essentially. There's a detail. So just the concrete, you know, the brightly synthetic acrylic paintings, there's a real great contrast there with the work. So I'll show you some details here and uh, um, pushing the 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 aesthetic kind of acceptance of collaged forms and relief forms on the work, hiding them, trying to hide them, camouflage them, blind plate. And then eventually they left the picture plane and you see one of the works here uh, in this show. So I, I look at these possible object series, um, you know, or this, the starting point of this work, through the lens of, you know, of trying to create something that is alien on one hand, um, but is also alive. It's it's breathing. It has, it has the possibility to be anything it wanted to be, or could be, or I want it to be. Um, it is the seed. It is also um, the core. You know, the core of, of of some geological kind of experiment or extraction. I call this prey because it feels like it could walk off the canvas or walk off the structure that it exists on. And I see the one in this show as it has it having the ability to walk off the plinth, fall off the plinth. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I just, you know, I, I conjure up these mental images and this idea of, of movement with the work. And there was a, a number of works that became um, started to reattach themselves to the picture plane. You know, taxidermy is sensed here. Is this part of a larger form? Where are the remaining parts? What are you? Um, so again, the main question always under inquiry here uh, for me, and it's connected to the inland show that I just talked about uh, moments earlier, is what makes a painting a painting? Uh, so, you know, the larger body of work here questions the nature and origin and function of objects as well. And it references the portrait of the Mark series in terms of suggesting a conscious form. There's a few more uh, works. Uh, so I, I do, you know, for my, my interest in environmental sciences and geology, you know, at least a couple times a year I'll get into slicing things. I just find it quite fascinating to slice a large you know this object that you see here you know it took it took a year to make you know really when you think about all that paint and all that curing all that time and then you know to come and slice it and polish it and, and spend time with it is a really satisfying um, uh, process uh, for a painter like me so uh, i do that maybe once or twice a year i, I bring out the, the saws and uh, you know i, I should probably get some lasers involved, um, but uh, still quite mechanical when it comes to uh, some of the more serious slicing that I do. Tracks referencing the graphic swaths through wet-dry resists, 
uh, the painting becomes more alien. A mountain of material stacked on illusion. So I do like this idea of the history of painting and illusion, because painting is both an object and illusion, so it's a natural desire for me to challenge the illusion and the object of it. And, you know, for years I tried to integrate services because I went to a, a quite a, you know, I had a lot of formalist instruction. Um, and there was always discussion around, you know, not allowing your viewer to know the beginning or the end of your painting. You know, like a good painting hides, um, I'm not suggesting this is truth, you know, in some ways it is, but, I, you know, my instruction as an early 20 year old was always around, hide the process. Why, why on earth would you show your process to the viewer? Because good painting exists or transcends the sum of its parts. We've probably all heard that. Um, I, I, yeah, sure, uh, I get that. Um, but in the last eight, nine years, I've really uh, enjoyed this idea of, of, of this collage aesthetic and placing objects on there that, in my mind, are, it's pretty clear what came first, what came second, what came third. Maybe not to my viewer, but um, this idea of integrated surfaces where everything has um, at least some sort of stabilizing kind of uh, progression, um, you know, where you have, you know, for instance, a work like this that has, uh, you know, four inches of relief, where you're bound to see or, you know, I guess classical um, instruction would suggest that, you know, you know, 50% of this painting surface must be um, in the median range of the highest elevation of the painting and the lowest elevation of the painting, just to get true integration of the materials. Um, at least that was my experience growing up. But, of course, a painting like this has, you know, it's, it's quite stressed, the painting. Right? It has high surface uh, relief, and then it has low surface relief. No, there's not much in between, right? So, and you see that in the show. Like some of the work, you know, you have far more kind of intermediate kind of surface areas and uh, language. And, uh, and what does that mean, I guess, in, in, in a conceptual sense? Well, some parts of the painting are screaming at you, and some are whispering, and there's not a lot of in between, right? So. Here's another example, Settle, I guess it's called, yeah, Settle. So there's a domestic graphic illusion partnered with a, a self-similar convex form. Two different paintings are pictured here, one suspended over the other. So yeah, you know, in many ways, you know, I'm challenging not only the history of abstraction here, but it's also challenging just different types of painting within my own practice. Uh, so if I go back 25 years in my own painting practice and I pull out 30 different distinct visual languages, um, which I probably could now, um, I like to start to put them together now. So it's a really, you know, now that I've been painting for as long as I have, I, I feel like I'm in a good space to really uh, make some significant challenges to abstraction and the history of abstraction. Uh, title fan, uh, the work is now exploring the echo gesture and reclaiming the sedimentary surface. The paint is less synthetic in the negative space. Most of the binder has been stripped away. Uh, trunk, craters are re-emerging in the work. You see them in this show. The reticulation of paint is referencing satellite imagery. Aerial perspectives are employed. They usually are, right? Scent, I catch a scent of my earlier influences here, Otto Rogers, Immaterial Landscapes. So every once in a while I'll do something, not intentionally, that will remind me of an earlier influence. And I see some of Rogers in this work. The next project I'll talk about, exhibition, uh, is Mechanical Eye, Ear, and Motion, Industrial Niagara. This is from 2019, 2020. There's a catalog, it's, it hasn't been published yet, but it will be soon. It was a collaborative project um, through the Brock University Research Center in Interdisciplinary Arts and Creative Culture. Uh, five of us participated. Atlas Steel in Welland, Ontario, and I, I, you know, my kids played soccer by this steel plant. So here's one of my examples of, here you have the Carolinian beauty of the forest, and then you have this still uh, operable uh, steel mill <laughs> right there in the city, 
that uh, I guess depending on who you are, you find attractive or pleasing to look at or not. Um, I kind of am on the fence about that depending on what I'm doing. Of course, we toured it. Um, it was constructed in 1918 uh, by Dillon Crucible Steel Alloy Company to produce high tensile tool steel. In 1939, the Canadian government uh, uh, bought it or invested in it uh, for World War II. Um, and by 1948, uh, it was regarded as one of the largest specialty steel companies in the British Commonwealth. So we toured the site. Uh, these are low light photographs because it really was quite low in there, the light. And a tremendous history on the site, just unbelievable. Um, the dust, you know, if you pick up the dust, you can just imagine all the things, all the people, all the tools, all the steel that was created for so many different initiatives. So much war and death, so much structure and you know, wealth. And it's just an amazing place. Uh, one million square feet under roof and approximately sits on 76 acres. And stainless steel ingots are pictured in the middle ground there. So this is a photograph. So I do, uh, to, you know, make some photographs. I'm primarily a painter, but uh, uh, I have printed and exhibited some photographs. So this is Tank, and uh, yeah, it's the outside of, of one of the structures there. Uh, so you know you have the, you, know, you just have a degradation and brokenness all around the space, but of course, this is a pigment print carnival. So the idea was to exhibit in the uh, spaces, uh, the, you know, to just like Silo City, uh, visit the space, spend time with it, document it, and then respond to the site, create an art installation. But the, while we were doing this, the mill uh, was sold to a European country, uh, uh, company, sorry, Italian library, and uh, we weren't able to actually go back to the space and uh, create um, our installation. So we had to work with a gallery, and uh, here's another one, a silver Atlas Steel series, the Atlas series. Um, here's another image of the plant. Old kilns, or furnaces, sorry. So the experience culminated in a research center Research Center of Interdisciplinary Arts and Creative Culture um, um, with Rodman Hall Art Center um, here. You can see one of my other forms here. I think that's a that's a different piece. Picture there, that is a different piece picture there. The Sunder Load. So the molten characteristics, so that's a key word here that I could refer to the sculpture in this room and I guess a lot of the paintings. The molten characteristics between the synthetic object and the stainless steel ingot are compelling to me here. I still hope to increase the scale. So, you know, when we were touring the plant and the, you know, thinking about ingots, and, you know, you have this raw product, you know, the stainless steel product um, or different metals that then get, you know, shipped away and they get formed into to, to, to different objects. I, I find that idea quite interesting. So I, I look at the sculpture in the room um, as being also an ingot. You know, what, what can it be? Sh what molten processes and what physical hammering could be uh, taken to that? And, and what would it be? Like, what, what, what is the object supposed to be? There's a detail. Float was a part of the show. And there was a few other pieces, but I won't get into them. So here, this is where we're at. We are, here's my studio in St. Catharines. Uh, this is actually one of our painting studios at school. Uh, I had to teach online last year, so I actually filmed uh, a lot, a, a great deal of the creation of these, pro these paintings, and, and I would use them as tutorials or partial tutorials to teach my students, uh, which was quite useful, you know, proved to be quite useful. So here's the beginning, you know, there, there you see it before any of these paintings existed in the room. That's kind of, that's my memory of it. Um, 
you know, I work predominantly on the horizontal, um, you know, uh, but I do obviously bring the paintings up vertically to uh, process them, finish them, to contemplate, I guess, their end point, how I'm going to finish them. Uh, but they do spend a lot of time on the ground, and I'm, I'm sure that's where the aerial kind of perspective comes from with my work. Or thinking as a from an aerial vantage point. <coughs> There's chariot, but you've got the real version right there. Detail, judges. Um, but I could talk about them here. So chariot, let's get back here. The weathered graphic tracks suggest confusion, a tight arena that cannot be escaped, or a possible field that has been plowed countless seasons. There is an after-image quality given rise to strobe-like movements. The spatial distortions are evident. Here I'm reminded of the historical nature of chariots, a tool of warfare, and my youth watching chariot races in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. So I'm very much interested in history. I do a lot of reading of you know, ancient history and warfare. You know, you know, again, I'm, we all are. I am the sum of you know, everything I've, I've, I've read and digested and thoughts I've had and thinking and struggles, pain, fear, love. All the things that make me a human, um, again, are channeled through me, through this voice, and uh, this is one expression of it, Chariot. And Chariot is based off a number of smaller paintings that I didn't show you here, um, from you know, probably 15 years ago, this idea of the Chariot. Uh, I do remember watching Chariot races, you know, at five, six years old at the exhibition grounds, and just being quite fascinated by you know, the history of motion and, uh, and uh, travel, warfare, and the fact that here now we're watching races with horses and wooden structures with wheels on them. So, I, you know, there's that tension, there's, there's, there, it's contained. You know, there, there is a, a struggle happening here in the painting. Uh, so judges seen here, uh, it's, titled, it's titled after Colin Stetson, who is an experimental musician, musician. A New History of Warfare, Volume 2, and Judges was released in 2011. Uh, listening to the chaos of our time, because these paintings were all created during COVID lockdown in Ontario, which was pretty harsh in many ways, um, you know, necessary, but you know, it, it was pretty isolating. So there was me in my studio with my music. I like a lot of experimental music, so, um, you know, I had this playing for weeks, months, and, you know, just to escape the, the chaos of, you know, the kind of world that, that we were living in. Um, so, you know, the painting itself became very chaotic, both, you know, because listening to the chaos of the politics, the media, and the music that I was listening in, listening to, um, you know, there, there, was, there, there was that type of thinking and that kind of, the feelings running through my, my body were, we're in that space. Uh, the painting breathes various levels of complex mark making, layers, fragmentation, washed and eroded over time. A frantic jostling of marks search for rest, but only disquiet and resistance remain. Lyrical passages are at play. So there's, you know, a painting like that, there's, it's hard to stabilize. There's just so much activity in that work. There's a detail. And here is a shot image from the studio, um, working on large format works and small format at the same time. You can see my camera there shooting demos. I have hours and hours and hours of demo footage uh, that I had to shoot for students uh, last year. Um, some of it really good and some of it maybe not so great. I have a, a landscaping rake like a steel rake that I like to bring into the studio and use on the paintings. You know, your standard brooms, sanders, power washers, um, you know. There's a lot of different things that I've, I've brought into the studios over the years, but uh, sand, you know, the, the ability to subtract has been a, a key one, uh, especially in the last uh, 10 years. You can see one of my larger conglomerates uh, sliced and polished, and this was a still from a video footage for my students. Studio shot here in St. Catherine's murder. 
the work on the right is a little glimpse of what I'm kind of doing right now with these thick resin pores that are transparent, uh, that have an opaque or translucent uh, top layer to them. I think I've got a couple more images there. So later, I'll, I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, shake it out. Uh, before starting this uh, new body of work, um, at the beginning of Ontario's first major lockdown, I, I made the conscious decision to kind of, and this, maybe this is midlife and, you know, being in my mid-40s and being a father and all the things that were happening and happening, um, I made the conscious decision to bring everything I knew or valued in terms of my, all my, of my visual language to these paintings with the hope of describing something new. Um, the question was, still is, you know, what if these were my last paintings? Um, what would they communicate? So as I'm approaching 50 years and thinking about, you know, the strength of my body and, you know, what can I do and not do? Because, you know, these paintings are heavy and they're, you know, they're hard on the body to make. Just moving them is hard on the body, let alone all the other things I have to do with them. You know, I was thinking about what if these were the last paintings? What would they communicate? What would they, how would they add to Canadian visual culture or painting culture at large? Uh, is this a new midlife wilderness, acknowledging my own fragility and my own humanity and fears? First fires pictured over there. Maybe you know, in many ways, it has a maybe new meaning based off the kind of summer we had here in the Okanagan. Um, and it does, in, in some ways, and maybe I'll unpack that for you, but the pluralistic nature of my painting uh, sources pulls across three decades for this work. I'm first reminded of my youth cutting posts and rails in burned out forests with my late uncle, having spent numerous years hauling wood with my body. So I, I spent many winters uh, and summers, but my memories are winter. Um, the cold, minus 30 Saskatchewan winters in the forest, burnt out forests, uh, cutting dried uh, fire kill timber um, and carrying them on my shoulders um, out posts and rails and having black soot all over me because um, that's how my father made a or my uncle my late uncle made a living uh, in the winter was cutting posts and rails so I was a youngster doing this um, so the heavy sweeping action of the dominant form suggests a carcass of sorts maybe the passing of this surrogate father or a synthetic creature here, the graphic tradition of painting meets with visceral and gestural angst, expressing my raw emotions concerning this new wilderness. In the end, I'm looking for peace. And there's a detail of that work. Uh, so, possible new direction in my studio practice, a corner glimpse at new work. This thick three inches so far as in cast with floating <coughs> objects, distorting light and mark, amplifying illusion through the transparent object hood seems very promising. Uh, so I, hopefully you can get the idea there. I, I'm quite intrigued by the distortion that happens right here, uh, bringing the marks to the surface. And this mark here is floating. Uh, so this, this is really where I ended my studio practice in Ontario, and I have um, haven't had time, I'll talk about it, uh, to restart just yet. But I'm really quite fascinated by this object illusion, like it feels new to me in terms of where I can take it uh, over the next five years. Uh, the last project that was happening while I was building this body of work was uh, River Rises. It was an art residency that took place in November 2020 at the Brown Homestead. It was another creative uh, collaborative project through Brock University's Research Center in Interdisciplinary Arts and Creative Culture. Four artists participated here. And the John Brown home is the oldest home in St. Catharines, 1796, which is amazing to walk through this home and work in it. Uh, between 1796 and 1804, the two-story loyal, loyalist Georgian home was an active farmhouse for more than 180 years. It was also used as a tavern and inn for more than a quarter of a century. So an interior bedroom here, this is where I spent most of my time. It's a restoration project and you know, I was drawing and photographing in here for three days, and it really just reminded me again of the poetics and history and erosion of spaces. Um, the room was full and captivated. Like, you know, we all live in homes. Maybe you built your home. Maybe you moved into a pre-built home. Someone else lived there. We just moved into a home that was 
uh, sold to us by one owner who built it, and, and I've met them and their children, and just the idea of their children growing up in that home, that's the only home their children knew, and now we've come in and we're living there now. I just like this idea of multiple lived spaces and multiple histories within a space. And I think that's why painting can be very pluralistic, where you walk up to a painting and it doesn't have just one read, it could have thousands of reads, especially abstract painting. And even as an artist, you know, I can approach even one of my works and, and I have all kinds of different emotions and thoughts running through my, my mind and my body through time. Even now that I see the work and I haven't, really, I haven't seen the work now for almost two months, you know, I, I have an objective or more of an objective kind of removed appreciation for the work um, that I didn't have when it was in the studio. So, you know, our, our relationship with uh, our own artwork can be very uh, interesting and complex. So the, the residency was a responsive to both the homestead and an auto-fictional narrative, or novel, sorry, a narrative novel uh, by Derek Knight. Uh, the draft novel of River Rises is a story about growing up in West Africa as a British youth, the collision of two worlds. My response to both influences circled around this idea of lost time. And uh, picture here are some provisional drawings and collaborative paintings. So they're just quick drawings and, and you know, just kind of thinking again about the beauty of, of this kind of ugliness that was a part of the space, right? Um, the artwork is, there, place, is in their placement for psychic space. The objects themselves are not really important. So it's not, you know, it's not the drawings and paintings that are important here. It's, it's how they felt in the space, which was, which was really important to me. Inverted sculpture, it's a high contrast image for a risograph publication that was made for the show. Um, and uh, it was a video that we created. I don't think I have the video here, but it became, yeah, at the end of the residency, we buried all our creative activities in this hole and, and the drawings and writings and glass vessels. So it was a ceremonial act, grieving over lost time. In many ways, it was uh, the, the, the artist who wrote the, the novel, uh, Derek Knight, was also grieving over the loss of a colleague who retired. And um, at this time, I didn't know I was moving out here, so it wasn't about uh, leaving uh, Niagara, but you know, maybe it was the precursor to it. Maybe it was like a great residency to participate in. And this is the, the, the Bernard Cella uh, designed the book out of, uh, from Austria, and uh, and uh, Bernard also designed the catalog for Inlet that I had showed you with the uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, poetry. Yeah, it might have been some foreshadowing, the fact that I was leaving Niagara and all those colleagues and friends. Uh, but what a beautiful book that was published. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Rising Graph is such a pretty, a pretty interesting uh, machine. How does this work? Oh, it does work. That's great. So here's a couple excerpts from the, uh, the video that was created for the exhibition. Yeah, it was a great, it was three days. It was a really wonderful, pleasant uh, experience uh, with uh, colleagues, so. So again, this idea of collaboration has been with me for a long time, and I continue to enjoy uh, collaborating with other artists. So here I am, moving my studio. This is just my studio. I had to uh, get rid of a lot of different items, and uh, my daughter and I, um, hopped in the U-Haul and traveled across, across this great country of ours, large country of ours, and uh, tried to convince her how wonderful it would be to live here when, every, if, when everything she, she really knows, or everything she really knows is uh, uh, from Ontario. So um, it took us five days to move here, or to, to drive here. And uh, I had that U-Haul uh, maxed out, let me tell you. And that's how these paintings uh, came here. So they survived and they, uh, there was very little damage, only a couple scuffs on the uh, edges of the paintings. So um, it was really, I was quite happy that, well, you know, all the other work, because there was probably 
I don't know how many paintings in that truck, but there was a lot in paint, so. Um, you just answered my question. I was thinking, how would you yeah. move all these yeah. things? <laughs> well, we had movers where you could remove the house, and I was tasked with moving uh, the artwork, so the studio. Um, so we moved to Lake Country. We're here. We're now uh, Lake Country residents, and I have a brand new, not brand new, I have a uh, pre-owned <laughs> studio here, and uh, it was an automotive uh, shop. It's a 1,300 square foot shop, and a uh, really beautiful shop with an amazing view of, of uh, the valley looking north, looking towards you know, Kalanoka and Wood Lake. Uh, but it was an automotive shop, so here I've got uh, folks removing a seven-ton hoist from my studio because I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how to use it. You know, really for paint, I knew how to use it, but I didn't know how. How could I paint with this? Maybe I could paint with this, but no, it, it would, I couldn't justify how much space it took up uh, in the studio. And plus, you know, the studio was kind of greasy. I have to get the floors redone, repaint it, um, get some new lighting in there. Hopefully, hopefully the studio will be operational uh, by winter, but I don't know. Um, I'm going to have to paint with my students because uh, my studio is not, uh, I won't be able to paint in it for a bit. I'm waiting on certain contractors to come in. But it'll be an amazing site, uh, you know, studio for me. I think it'll be the, I, you know, one of the best studios I've ever had, so I'm really looking forward to that. And here you see an image of this show. So I'm really grateful to, to Lumosh and uh, to have the opportunity to showcase um, you know, this idea of wilderness and you know, kind of some of the struggles and thinking that I've gone through as a painter. So you know, wilderness, as I've, I've stated already here, um, you know, pulls upon across many different kind of ideas. You know, I, I think one idea I haven't really talked much about here, maybe I should comment on, is you know, the wilderness of painting, of abstract painting. 2,000 years worth of history and abstraction, you know. You know, we've got uh, synthetic or you know, analytical cubism. We could write, we'd probably rationalize and go a little bit further back in time there. Depends how you, you want to look at expressionism. But, you know, we've got a lot of history to contend with. And I think as a painter, especially myself, my own narrative, and my own headspace as a painter has always been, you know, how on earth am I going to contribute to so much history and so much time? And, you know, is there, you know, what, what, is there anything new to say? Is there any new pain? Is there new language? What would new language look like? Um, new experiences. And I, I think, you know, you know, as an as a abstract painter, there's, you know, I've been walking through a wilderness of kind of time for a very long, long time of, you know, where is the, you know, where is this idea of, of, of new terrain and territory? Um, and that's been a struggle because I think as young artists, we're, we have that burden, right? To, we carry that burden with us because we feel like it's, it's it, well, it is necessary because why on earth would we make paintings that have been made before? And, um, and I don't know, is that the headspace or the call or the, the conviction call of, of most painters or artists? I don't know. But I think there is that pressure on, on artists, um, regardless if they acknowledge it or not, especially ones that want to you know, turn it into a profession and want to you know, really tackle it because they, they love it, right? So you know, that wilderness is definitely there on my mind and thinking about it. So between the Anthropocene and the poisoning of the world, and you know, what kind of world are my children going to grow up in, and my grandchildren, and moving, relocating, and um, you know, our own lives and our fragility and death and fear and uh, all the good things in life too, right? Because there is a lot of goodness and beauty that we see, and the fact that we can stand in this room and look at paintings. Um, like this uh, should tell us that um, uh, there's a lot of goodness and a lot of um, uh, great things that we get to experience, especially here in Canada, uh, considering the wealth that we have as a country. So, so this kind of wilderness, um, 
Yeah, I hope to continue pursuing this idea of painting through the wilderness, uncultivated and unknown. Um, and we'll see what, what the next 10 years look like um, for myself. So there, that's a little glimpse of, uh, kind of give you a bit of a bit of context for this show. Uh, as I was driving here, I was thinking, you know, now that I've been, it's been a couple months since I've seen the show, and, and I've been so focused on, you know, the relocation with my kids, I was trying to, you know, relate to the show in a new way, not through the talk here, but just in my own headspace, driving up and thinking about all the little moments of creating this work and being disappointed or excited. And, and really, you know, the impression that I felt driving here was that, you know, this work, all the painting, all it, all it really does is capture time. You know, it's a memory, right? I have a physical object hanging on, on the wall, but it really is just a memory, at least to the artist, or maybe to the viewer as well, if they can relate to it. Uh, but when I look at my work now in this show, I, I relate it, I, I, I respond to it, and I think of it as a memory of a particular period of time. And, and maybe that has more to do with the fact that I just relocated across the country and I'm entering a new phase of life. But I don't know. I, I, I look at a lot of old work I've collected um, from various artists over the years, and especially the work that I've collected from years ago, like 20, 25 years ago. It is a memory. I look at that work as a, a memory both of that artist and as that time period of where I was living and thinking, what I was struggling with, or what I was loving about life. Um, and yeah, so my late country drive here was um, that these paintings now are a memory. Because the painting uh, in the middle there was the last painting that I created in Ontario. So I can remember the last few moves on it, because I was conscious of the fact that this is the last painting I'm gonna paint in my Niagara studio. So there, there's a really interesting, I don't know, I, I, I've never really experienced that before where I'm making a painting and I know this is the last painting I'm gonna make in this space that has meant so much to me. So, you know, that's an interesting kind of parameter to the making of a work. Um, and I suppose that's the beauty of residencies when you travel around the world and go to different spaces. But then even in a residency, you're only there for X number of uh, months or maybe it's a short year or something like that. But to live and breathe in a space for 10 years and then acknowledge that it's the last few marks you're gonna make in that space, there's something really poetic about that. So, And that's the real strange thing about coming back here to uh, the Okanagan and teaching at the UBC campus is that I'm in studios teaching students that are new to me um, but I'm, uh, the space is so familiar, you know, where I had you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of students come through. So, uh, to summarize, life has been very interesting. So, and I feel, I, feel, I feel very fortunate that I get to paint and teach painting. Um, it's really a beautiful life, so I have no uh, regrets or issues with um, any of it, really. So, um, 